Welcome to Runtime Process Infection. My name is Sean Webb, and I go by the handle Ladera online. Um, this presentation is brought to you by a hacking community called Soldier X. They deal mostly with uh, reverse engineering, and um, they've got a, a, a lot of talented folk on their crew. So this is the first time I've given this presentation up in Canada, and while my roommate up here was uh, was getting in the getting ready for the day. I turned on the TV, and the first thing I saw was red green. Do we have any uh, red green fans in here? Woohoo! A few. So uh, because I grew up just uh, I grew up about three hours away from Canada, uh, south in Washington State, a major Canadian influence, and I love red green. So I'm going to start this presentation off with the man's prayer. I'm a man. I can change if I have to, I guess. So I am just a, a, another tech blogger um, on the inner tubes. I run a small uh, tech blog called zeroxviewpace.org. And, um, and I just blog about things that interest me, things that I'm doing, uh, mainly about security and FreeBSD and IPv6. Um, I am the author of a Drupal module that makes administrating um, VNet jails really, really easy. So, um, so yeah, I'm a professional security engineer. I've been working professionally in the in the security scene for a number of years, um, and I just love it. It's my passion. Uh, as a hobby, though, I've been programming in C for 13 years. Um, I'm still a bit of a noob, but there's, uh, I, I'm pretty decent. So I'm a member of Soldier X, Bi Binary Revolution, and Hack3R. They are hacker communities that are kind of similar to each other, just a lot of, a lot of kids who, uh, who love to program and, and, uh, and do different things. You can find me on Twitter. Uh, my handle is Ladera. And I am. I frequent Freenode IRC. I'm on the FreeBSD channel. I'm supposed to give a shout out to them. Um, so uh, I do have a few disclaimers, though. Of course, uh, opinions and views expressed here are mine only, and not that of my employers, my previous employers, current employer, or future employers. Have to say that to cover my butt, and theirs too. Uh, my talk is semi-random. There's a lot of background info that I need to explain, so it's gonna gonna appear semi-random, but it'll all make sense in the end. We're gonna tie every single piece of background information together. So almost nothing new is explained. The theory, the underlying theory, is very well known um, and understood. A run runtime process infection—that's how malware works. Um, you can you can take a look at. A lot of the basic theories um, on FRAC, um, Google for runtime process infection, you'll get a whole bunch of, uh, you'll get a nice big reading list. Uh, I do have a new spin on existing techniques for getting your shell code to be stored and run. So even though the underlying theory is very well known, I do have a new spin on existing techniques. The presentation and tools uh, that I'll talk to you guys about uh, is only for educational purposes only. Again, this is just to cover my butt. I'm not responsible for anything you guys do. And really, this, this presentation is kind of a, a high-level presentation. So there's not really much you know, that you can do with the presentation material. Um, I do make a few assumptions. We're at BSD CAN, so uh, I assume you know what free BSD is. Uh, I assume you, ha you have a basic knowledge of C and 64-bit memory management. So I assume you know what uh, the printf is, what malloc is, mmap, that kind of stuff. And I assume you know what a uh, memory mapping is, a heap and a stack, that kind of thing. As security engineers and analysts, uh, we, all, we have to think abstractly. We have to think outside the bun. Think of how the original engineers designed uh, what we're looking at and, and figure out how to use that and utilize it in ways that they didn't originally intend. 
Um, the presentation does it assume a non-modified memory layout. GR second packs, of course, don't exist on FreeBSD. But the, the concepts are, are similar. You know, I assume no ASLR, essentially, uh, just to make the presentation easy. So to give a little bit of history, um, a few years back I was looking at CGI and web application vulnerabilities. My main purpose was to get a shell on the box. Um, so I, I would utilize connect back shell code. So when I would gain a shell on the box, what would happen is on my box locally, I would have, I would run netcat and have it listening on a port. And the shell code that is running on the, on the victim, on the target box, uh, would connect back to my netcat instance and drop me into a shell. So I needed reliable random access. Of course, this, this kind of paradigm doesn't really work if I'm at McDonald's, if I'm at uh, a friend's house, if I'm at a hotel. No matter what, you know, I need to be able to forward a port to my local computer, which you know, doesn't, doesn't really work. Firewall holes are a bit of a problem. So I needed to, I figured, you know, uh, the web server is already listening for a port, so let's reuse that existing connection to the web server. I also needed a way to covertly sniff traffic. There was one instance where I needed to get at the uh, at some traffic that was encrypted with SSL, and I needed the decrypted version of that of the data. So I created a tool called LibHijack, and we'll talk about LibHijack a little bit later. So to set the stage for this presentation, we're going to pretend as though we got a shell via a CGI or web application exploit. Um, and we're just we're primarily, look, primarily looking for a reliable way to get back in. Nginx is a good candidate um, because I, I say Nginx here because Apache um, uh, has some extra security things. Back when I was originally looking at this, they didn't. And my original target was Apache, but now it's Nginx because Nginx doesn't have the same security settings that, or uh, security code practices that, um, that Apache does. So and we'll do a live demo against Nginx today after, uh, after the presentation. So, um, you know, I thought it was a good candidate because uh, it's already listening for connections. So I, my main goal then is to modify the Nginx process somehow to, uh, to run a shell when I send it a special string. So when I send it get slash shell, HTTP slash 1.1, it needs to drop me into a shell. And you know, I could run the who am I command and it would tell me I'm dub dub dub. So, uh, so we need to be able to hook certain functions in runtime. So anytime Nginx receives this string, it will drop me into a shell. So it has to happen multiple times because I might connect to this uh, box multiple times. So now we're going to talk a little bit about what happens when uh, exec VE is called, when a process is loaded. Um, the kernel first checks for very basic stuff, whether the file's there and whether you have permission to run it. Then it loads what is called the runtime linker, uh, the RTLD, um, for short. And then it loads all the process metadata and initializes the stack. Those two things are kind of reverse. It first does the process metada metadata and initializes the stack, and then does the runtime linker. Didn't have time to reverse that. Anyways, uh, the metadata is located at that hex address on FreeBSD AMD64. I have that there really, uh, wow, that's uh, cut off on the right side. Um, is there a way to fix that? Makes you feel any better about getting the full size. Okay. Is there any way to fix that? Probably use OPSD. Uh, okay. Well, you guys, it, it's okay. I'm saying what, it, what needs to be said anyways. Yeah, we're, we're good. I, I included that hex address on the slides because I'm going to put the slides up on my tech blog and so, so you can have an easy place to reference. Um, so the runtime linker, its job is to finish loading the process in a memory. It loads all the dependencies, all the shared objects like libc, if you're Wireshark, Wireshark libpcap, that kind of thing. 
It then patches what is called the procedure linkage table and global offset table for needed dynamic functions. We'll talk about the, the PLT GOT a lot in detail later. Then it calls all the initialization routines for all your dependencies. Um, and then it finally turns control over to your intended process. It calls main. Elf, best Christmas movie ever. I'm big on the Christmas, and, uh, and I start watching it in November. Uh, it drives my wife insane, but I love it. Francisco. Um, it's, ELF stands for the ex executable and linkable format. All it is is it's metadata. It's just data that describes data. It tells the runtime linker what to load and how to load it. So you have different, you have different header files, um, uh, or rather C structs. So if I say, not header files, you have different headers. Um, if I say header, I mean C struct. That's, that's what I mean. So you have the main ELF header, and that has pointers to other different headers. Some of those different headers are the process header, which you have to have, at minimum, one entry for your binary to be uh, valid. It contains virtual address locations, so where in memory is this data going to be stored? Access rights, whether you can read from it, write to it, or execute it, and alignment. Where inside of this virtual address location is it going to be located? Is it going to be in the beginning, in the middle, in the end? That type of thing. Then you have section headers. You don't have to have any section headers. In fact, when you strip a binary, you pretty much strip, strip out all the section headers. Um, it describes the data that is loaded uh, via, the, via the process headers. It contains a string table, debugging entries, if any, and compiler comments. Fun little trivia, old school viruses used to store their payload inside of compiler comments. So there's the dynamic headers as well. Um, those contain relocation entries, stubs, and the PLT GOT, the procedure linkage table, and global offset table. And that's really the jackpot. That's where all the magic happens. This is how uh, an ELF binary looks in memory when it's loaded. So at the top, you have the, the main ELF header. And right below that, you have uh, the program header table, also called the process header table. And then you have the, the actual data that is used by the program, the, your read-only data, your uh, executable code, all that kind of stuff. And the section header, uh, those may or may not get loaded at runtime, depending on how that binary was constructed and how it's instructing the runtime linker how to load itself. So debugging, Ptrace is the old school debugging facil facility for FreeBSD. I say old school because it really ought to be replaced outright with Dtrace. So um, Dtrace is much cooler, but we're going to use Ptrace because it's still available. It is a kernel system call. And GDB, the GNU debugger, relies heavily on Ptrace. Ptrace is the back end for GDB. It's how it's able to uh, do its magical debugging work. You can read and write from and to arbitrary memory locations. Uh, and you can even, uh, but that memory location has to be valid. So you can't just write to a memory mapping that doesn't exist. It has to actually exist. You can get and set all the registers, the current instruction pointer, the E flags, every single register, every single CPU register can be changed with Ptrace. So essentially, with Ptrace, you're God. When you, when you attach um, uh, as a debugger to a, another process using Ptrace, you can change every single part of the program. And so this little, this next bullet, uh, Debuggy becomes child of a debugger. That's a little bit important as far as terminology is concerned. Because we're going to, in the presentation, I'll, I'll say parent or child relationship. And I'll be the counselor between the two. Um, but let's say, let's say I'm a Firefox developer. And I want to debug one of the memory leaks that so plague Firefox. 
And uh, so I have Firefox already running. It's on Homestar Runner, downloading a whole bunch of Flash content, you know. And, uh, and then in a terminal on the other screen, I've got GDB loaded up. So, uh, uh, so we have Firefox and GDB. They were started at completely separate points in time. They're unrelated to each other. Um, they were started in different manners. So they're completely unrelated. But when you attach GDB to Firefox, then uh, Firefox conceptually becomes the child of GDB. It's as if GDB were, have, were to have spawned Firefox itself. So, uh, so when I say the parent process, then I, I'm talking about GDB or about lib hijack. And if I'm talking about the child process, then it would be Firefox or Nginx. And it's destructive. Um, a user is going to know, if you're, if you're using ptrace against a, a GUI application, for example, a user will notice that something's happening. Uh, the process just pauses there. If you're in Firefox and you click on, on a text box, it, nothing will happen. Not even a little cursor will, will display. Um, the process is completely paused, so it's destructive. And this probably isn't true, but I like to think so. Um, the original Ptrace engineer, I like to think, is evil as an evil genius. Likely knew it could be abused because you really are God over a process. You can change. I mean, like, you could, you could switch out Nginx and have it run LS instead. Like, technically, you could do that. But um, you could, you know, it's, and Ptrace is pretty powerful. There is one limitation in that. You can't, you can't use ptrace against any process unless you're root. If you're root, you can, you can call ptrace against any process on the system except for the init process. But if you are not root, then you can only call ptrace against processes that you own. So processes whose UID matches your UID. So there are some current techniques for getting your shellcode stored and run. The first and originally very, very popular way was to store your shellcode on the stack. Um, and that was really, really made popular by uh, a guy named LF1 who wrote an article for Frack called Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit. You all probably know about that paper in this room. But, but yeah, it was really popular. And because of its popularity, on most systems today, the stack is non-executable. Uh, you, can, you can store your code there. You can store your shell code there all you want, but you're not going to get it to run. You can store your shell code at the current instruction pointer at rip. Um, but the problem with that is that it mucks up the original code. You can only get your shell code to run once, because what you need to do then is back up the original code that was originally executing, overwrite it with your malicious shell code, and then run your malicious shell code, and then uh, restore the backed up code. And that doesn't really work for our purposes, because you only get, if you do that, you only get your shell code to run once. We need our, our malicious code to run multiple times. Every time data is received and it matches that string, that special string, we need to drop into a shell. So clearly, this, though this would be, this would be nice, it, it's a guaranteed spot where you have uh, uh, guaranteed execution, but it just won't work for us. You could store your shellcode on the heap, and that used to be very popular. And although it's not as, as uh, popular today to make the heap non-executable, it's becoming so. You could use LD preload, but chances are we, we just uh, pwned um, uh, a non-root process. And we don't want to gain root because if the system's properly configured, there's probably log files, you know, IDS that says uh, only certain processes can run as root and maybe certain only at certain times. So, and the process is already started. We would need to restart the process, meaning gain root. So, we have this arbitrary code to store. We have this shell code to store, but we can't store it anywhere. Where do we do it? What we're going to do is we're going to force the child process to allocate memory. And this is the new spin. This is the, the slightly new technique. We're going, unlike 
Windows and OS 10, we cannot allocate in behalf of the child inside of the parent process. The child must be the one to allocate. And that's kind of a problem because the child is probably just waiting on disk access or network access or input from the user. And so it, though it might uh, allocate memory right now, it's only going to allocate memory in the stack or in the heap. It's not going to allocate something we can use for our purposes. So that, that presents kind of a problem. So what we're going to do is we're going to find where the kernel is called inside of this program. We're going to uh, look for the assembly syscall and uh, opcode. And uh, the problem is, is that the program's main code won't ever call the kernel. Um, it'll call library functions which call the kernel, you know, like libc. libc calls the kernel everywhere. Like when you, when you do printf, it actually has to write stuff to the, to the console, which is actually a privileged, uh, uh, a privileged um, operation. The kernel has to be the one to, to do all that. So what we'll do is we'll find a library function that calls, calls the kernel by crawling through all this elf metadata, by going through all these elf headers and parsing them out. So the main elf header contains a pointer to the process header, and the process header contains a pointer to the dynamic headers, and the dynamic headers contain a pointer to the GOT, the global offset table, and the second entry of the global offset table contains a pointer to the uh, OBJ entry structure. And I say second global offset table entry here, and the slide says one, because we're starting at a zero offset, so zero, one. Um, and the OBJ entry structure